Well, good morning, folks, and welcome back to another beautiful morning here on the farm. Well, I say beautiful. It's actually raining pretty good here this morning. And as you can see, the sun's not quite up yet. It's right around 8 o'clock. Yesterday's video, if you haven't watched yesterday's video, highly encourage you to go back and watch that. 10 Strategies for Homesteading Success. And it talks about why every day I get up before the sun gets up. And why that alone is not enough. So if you haven't had a chance to watch that video, uh, here's the Reader's Digest version of it. <clears throat> why is it so important to get up before the sun comes up? Well, the reality is, I mean, like I said, it's 8 o'clock here. And we're, we're probably not going to get full daylight until, well, easily 9. The TSX opens at 8 o'clock. We're on Mountain Standard Time there on Eastern Time. So reality is for three hours, while, while you're snuggled up in bed still waiting for the sun to come up, there's folks on the East Coast that have already made decisions about how the rest of your day is going to go. So you, maybe you can't beat them to the punch, but you sure can make sure that uh, by the time that decision's made, you're at least aware of it so that you can react appropriately to it. Because nobody, and I mean nobody, I mean unless you're a total weirdo, I guess, likes to get caught with their pants down. Anyway, speaking of caught with your pants down, not literally, figuratively, <laughs> today being the weekend, I really wanted to get out into the garden and go dig the rest of our carrots, but as I said, it's raining. So <laughs> not that the weather really ever puts me off anything, but it's usually a lot nicer to try and dig carrots when the soil is dry and you're not packing 10 pounds of mud on your boots. On that note, however, as you guys know, we got 500 pounds, or very close to 500 pounds of potatoes that came out of our garden. And I've got a strategy for keeping them and storing them. Carrots are a little bit different, however. And so I'm not 100% confident that we can store all our carrots for the duration of the winter season without, you know, freezing and blan or blanching and freezing and, you know, all that stuff, which takes up a lot of very valuable room in the freezer. And we have a pig that we're going to butcher here soon. And so we're going to need that freezer space. So I'd be interested to hear from you folks, what's your go-to storage method for carrots from the garden to keep them fresh all winter long? I just got to pack in three big boxes of baby wipes. We recently announced my wife is pregnant. We're going to have a little baby in March of 2022. That's very exciting news. <laughs> and uh, so we're putting off lambing season so that we have some time we have a little bit of time to get home and get settled and get into a routine and then we'll get into lambing season but the other thing we did yesterday to prepare for lambing season is we signed on the dotted line so we also recently announced we're going to be building a barn the gentleman was here yesterday from integrity post frame structures they are the folks that actually built the shell for our shop they, they framed it and put the outside tin on we finished the whole inside but they did the outside so they're going to do the outside of our barn and very similarly to that project, <clears throat> we'll be finishing the interior ourselves. So that should be done somewhere January, February-ish, depending on schedules, weather, all of those kind of things. So that means today I've got to make some phone calls to a couple of contractors for building a pad. <laughs> and now I, I talked again yesterday in yesterday's video about really doing some of this stuff yourself and not having to hire some of it out because if you're paying people money, I mean, you're, you could just be burning money that you could theoretically use for something else if you had the skill set. Thing is, I might have the skill set, but I don't have the, the equipment. The old Massey tractor <laughs> isn't, uh, isn't quite up to building a 100-foot pad. So we're going to hire that one out. And uh, again, setting of the structure and all that stuff, we'll have the guys come and build it. But the finishing of the interior, I could do that all day long. Just need a hammer and some nails. Anybody can swing a hammer, right? So no excuse to pay somebody to do that. So being that we signed the deal on the barn yesterday, it's time to get, I guess, our poop in a group and get doing some measurements. You can see I got the corner post here, the other corner post there. I don't have anything on the back side yet because the barn is gonna be 50 feet long, takes it to the other side of this fence. So what that means is that here in the next few hours, I'm gonna take this apart, remove the gates, I'll probably have to lock the horses up or this could get sideways. But anyways, yeah, some of this fence is going to get dismantled all the way back to that post there, I think. And then I got to build a temporary fence around where the pad for the barn is going to be. So we're going to set the barn back away from that fence line a little bit and into the horse pasture a little ways. 
reason for that is it's going to be a, a piece of linking infrastructure. It's going to tie in the sheep lambing pen and the horse pasture so that if we ever need to bring in a horse into the barn or we ever need to bring in, you know, lambing ewes or something like that into the barn, we'll have that functionality. Earlier this, was it earlier this month or late last month? I can't remember. I finally put a gate down there beside the water so that we could even technically run cows up into here if, uh, you know, long term we get a whole bunch of cows calving up here or something like that. We could technically put one of those in the barn. So it is definitely, you know, we're putting a lot of thought in the design side of things as opposed to just plunking a barn down wherever we think it's going to be aesthetic and think about, okay, well, you know, we're really going to have to work with this and for the rest of our lives. This is not something you can just pick up and skid and move. This is, this is permanent infrastructure. We did actually look at a couple of uh, options for some portable barn structures. They're like a, a steel, they're made out of two and three eighths pipe. And if you really had to, you could unbolt the structure and move it and then reposition it somewhere else. But I wasn't really satisfied with what I thought was perhaps the uh, expected lifespan of that building versus something that's really anchored down to the ground. So that's why we spent a, well, really, it wasn't that much more expensive. It was really only about $10,000 more to put a fixed structure in versus a portable structure. So it just made more sense, I guess. So I got the old yellow tractor and the post pounder all hooked up here. And as you can see, I've got my fence post locations for the temporary fence all marked out with electric fence posts. So I'm gonna have six, I think six to pound, six, and then one, actually seven. So I got one for a brace for where that fence kind of ends, because that that's sheep lambing pen is gonna be a fixed asset. That's not gonna move this fence line here from here to kind of where the tack shed is. We really don't have a plan as to what's gonna happen there. I'm, I'm thinking big picture wise, that's probably all gonna end up getting torn out. But I don't want to take that on just yet because that requires quite a bit of additional thought and uh, additional thought is sometimes easier to do when you have a massive 36 by 50 barn in the <laughs> in the yard already and you can it can help visualize right as opposed to just trying to visualize off of these little white marker posts it doesn't really doesn't really put a picture in your mind as to how what the how things are going to flow and how things are going to function so we'll put the temporary fence up for now get the barn built and then we'll worry about that fence line down there. Well, I'm down here now with all the sheepy sheeps. Hey, Kylie. And uh, looking at the girls and seeing, you know, again, looking at the girls, looking at the grass and thinking, man, here, November 15th, all these girls are gonna have to be up by the house and introduced to the breeding ram. So we want these girls to be in top-notch condition. And so when you're looking at the grass and thinking, man, is that really getting them into top-notch condition? No, no, it's not. So then what would I have to do? On a typical year, I would keep them on pasture and then I'd bring them up two weeks before breeding and I'd start giving them about a half a pound each a grain a day, kind of get them, increase their conditioning a little bit. And uh, they cause a process called flushing. But I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, man, even if I come up there, I'd need probably, I probably need four weeks on grain to get them up, to get them up to where they need to be before breeding. So I'm going to trick up my sleeve that we're going to do here. So something that's even better than grain is a molasses lick tank. I picked up this one a few weeks back from Bloom Enterprises and it's got like a little roller ball in here. You just pour molasses in the top. So I got a pail of the molasses here. It's 28% protein supplement in molasses and it's got all the minerals and everything that they could ever possibly need. Now over the course of summer when this grass was green and lush, they really weren't interested in this stuff at all. They had no desire for it because they were getting everything they need off the grass. But I mean, you look at the grass now and you think, yeah, yeah, it's left wanting. So I just put the lick tank out a couple weeks back with the rams and I've noticed the last four or five days, the rams have actually been up there licking at it more and more. So that's a good sign. That's a good sign they're getting used to using the lick tank as well as it gives me some indication exactly the quality of the grazing that they're able to, to do. 
So we're gonna put this one out here. Like I said, today, I, I'm gonna drop it out here. I don't expect him to even go lick at it today. But I do expect it in four, five, six maybe days, a week-ish, that all of a sudden they're gonna be all over it. And that's what we're gonna do, that's the trick. That's what's gonna bring the conditioning up on these girls so that by the time I bring them up into the farmyard, I may not, I may not even need to flush with grain. We'll see, we'll see what it looks like. I don't know, they might prove me wrong. I just put the tank out there empty and they're already, already clamoring all around it. So I'll go ahead and dump this in. This is what it looks like. Oh, just yummy looking, hey? But it's actually, uh, it doesn't taste like molasses at all. It really tastes more like uh, some kind of vinaigrette, but <laughs> these pale, holy man, this pails are heavy. They weigh about uh, twice as much as a bucket of water. Well, yeah, color me corrected. Kylie's got it all over her lips already. Irene's right after it. So there you go, for the win, hey? Yum, yum. So I'm almost done with the temporary fence here. I got one, two, three strands. And uh, well, as you can see, I'm not even putting a corner brace in and I'm not even using a wire tensioner. In fact, I'm just hooking it to the winch on the side-by-side -side and sucking it tight, stapling it up, kind of hitting the easy button. But I can get away with that with this project simply because it's going to go in in probably two to three weeks. This ground is going to be frozen solid. So those fence posts aren't going to go anywhere. We have horses in this pen. So, I mean, the horses aren't going to put really little to no pressure at all on the barbed wire fence. So not overly concerned there. And then pretty much as soon as, as soon as the barn is built, we're going to be getting into spring. I'm going to be tearing this out and redoing the whole thing anyway. So I didn't want it to be too, what's the word I'm looking for? Beefy. Beefy doesn't seem like the right word to use for a horse pat or a horse pen, but uh, I guess, yeah, that's what we'll go with. We don't want it to be too beefy. Speaking of beef though, since we're on the subject, Milwaukee tools. I don't own much for Milwaukee tools. In fact, I only own one Milwaukee tool. My wife bought me a Milwaukee indestructible hammer last year. I think it was for Christmas. I think it was in my stocking. Anyways, <laughs> that does not look like an indestructible framing hammer at all. In fact, yeah, a couple weeks ago we were building some fence and I was trying to pull some nails out of the fence post and literally just pulled it right out of the socket here. So that's not good. <laughs> and uh, I just tapped the head back on and completely forgot about it until today when I'm trying to pound staples in the fence and here I tweaked her again. So. I don't know if, uh, if Milwaukee has any warranty on their tools or not, but I think all I'm going to do is I'm just going to drill a hole right in the end of the head there, tap this thing back where it's supposed to be, and jam a big screw in there like a wedge and see if it'll stay on. Okay, well, I think it's time. Projects are all done for the day, and I really haven't had that much to eat. So uh, my wife's been slow roasting a ham all day, and I can smell it coming through the kitchen vents. So better head inside and get myself some supper. So I hope you have a fantastic evening, and we'll see you tomorrow.